Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 1. I don't know why it's on Sunday night the mics go out. I don't, I don't know what that is. We, they work Wednesday night. They work Sunday morning. For some reason, Sunday night, the mics just want to act wonky. So. Uh, very thankful that uh, Sadie, at the, last, at the last moment, agreed to play piano, um, which is no easy task for anybody. And just to show how good God is, though, if you remember... Back about a year ago, probably, she would have stood up here and dug her arm until she bled just about, trying to get through one song. And now, without even a warning, she's willing to play piano and lead singing in church. So that just shows what God can do if we pray and pray and seek Him and, and let Him intercede on our behalf. And it doesn't mean that I'm sure she has some rumbles in the tummy when she gets up here, but she's able to do it. And God has been good to us and blessed us so abundantly. Um, in so many ways. So we're going to look at the, the book of Romans chapter 9 tonight, and we are going to look at God's providential grace. God's providential grace. And we look at Romans chapter 9, and we're talking, uh, starting as Paul is speaking in Romans 9, about the nation of Israel. And it's important to know who we're talking about, because when you look at the Bible, there's a lot of different groups that are discussed. We see the pagans, we see non-believers, we see the church, we see the nation of Israel. And as Paul is speaking here to the church in Rome, he is explaining something about the Jews. Because this question has come up, even back then, what about the Jews that don't believe? If God has made a promise to the nation of Israel going back to the covenants, what about the Jews that don't believe? And Paul is addressing those answers in the book of Romans chapter 9. A lot of churches have took what I call the easy way out. They say, well, the church has just it has replaced Israel. Well, that, that can't be so. And the reason it can't be so is that would be no different than if I promised Sadie uh, my guitar, and then Drew come along, and he made me happier, so I'm saying, nope, never mind, you can't have it now, now Drew's getting it. Well, as a parent, you all would say, that's pretty unfair and pretty poor parenting. Well, God is not a poor parent. God is the perfect parent. So when God made a promise, he kept that promise. Now, what Paul is going to do, and what I love about this, is Paul takes it and neatly puts it all together like a puzzle and makes it so plain and so simple that anyone can understand it. We just don't read it. That's why people don't understand it. But we're going to get into the Word tonight in Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 1, where the Bible says, I say the truth in Christ. This is Paul speaking. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. What Paul opens up with is how much he's hurting. See, Paul is a freeborn Jew. He was from the lineage of the Pharisees. He, he, was, uh, he was big on the Pharisaical law. So the Jews are his people. And he explains there that his heart is breaking for the people because they do not believe. You see, Paul knows how wonderful it is to have a relationship with Jesus. Paul knows how wonderful it is to have all your sins washed away as far as the east is from the west. He knows what it's like not to know the Lord by the law, but to know the Lord in a salvation relationship, adopted in to be a son by grace. And he wants his people to know that. We should feel the same way about our people tonight. Uh, most of us, if not all of us here tonight, are saved and born again. And in that, it should break our hearts that we've got family outside of grace. That we've got neighbors outside of grace. That we've got co-workers outside of God's grace. And the fact that our heart breaks for them should be what motivates us to serve God more faithfully. Guess what? It ain't going to matter what kind of car you got, job you got, or anything else when it comes down to how impactful you are for God. You see, God is a very simple God. He's not complicated, really. And He doesn't make it complicated for us. But we have to be willing to do what the Bible's called us to do when working and discipling and sharing the Word with others. Does that mean everyone we know is going to get saved? Sadly to say, no. 
But look what Paul says. This is how much Paul's heart breaks. He goes as far as to say that he, he, he wishes he was a cursed from Christ for his brethren. In other words, he would say, if it would get my brethren into heaven, you could send me to hell in their place. If we look at, at, at our neighbors, our loved ones, our friends that are lost from that same place of anguish, I guarantee you're going to be a lot busier soul winning. Because, I, I, I mean, I'll be full confession. I Really, my heart breaks for the lost. That's why I started preaching. But I don't know if I, I, well, I can say I don't think I've ever been where Paul is here. I've never had the prayer, Lord, if it saves them, send me to hell. I've never been that earnest. But I should be. Paul was that way for his, not just his family, not just his immediate family, his brothers, sisters, and his entire Jewish family, his kinsmen. Imagine if your prayer for all the people on Hearts Creek was, Lord, do whatever it takes to get them saved. Lord, if i got to suffer, that's okay. Get them saved. Lord, if i got to go through a trial, that's okay. Get them saved. Whatever it takes, just save them, Lord. If we had that kind of earnestly the way Paul has, we'd be a lot more impactful. Yeah, our life may not be as cushy. It may not be as easy. There's times that we may wake up at night with our heart. Because I tell you what I've learned, the closer I follow God, a lot of times the rougher my life is. Because the devil don't want you following God. The devil's going to shoot fiery darts left and right at you the moment you get on fire for God. But guess what? It's worth it in the end. You start seeing people saved. You start seeing the baptistry get filled up. We start seeing people in these pews. And I don't care if it's this pew. I'm not in pews anywhere. Then you know what? It's You get blessed. You're okay with the suffering. You're okay with the heartache. You're okay with the suffering. Because you get the mind of Paul. And you realize the most important thing is heaven and hell. For eternity. This stuff is temporary. But everything else is eternal. Let's look down to verse 4. As Paul begins to explain... Why it is that there's a privilege to be in his life. People, you know, they say, well, we're justified by grace. How is Israel God's chosen people? Well, Paul explains that starting in verse 4 where he says, Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Whose are the fathers? And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. And Paul, as he's explained this, first off tells it as Israelites, they were adopted as a nation. Now listen, if you catch nothing else, I want you to hear that. They're adopted as a nation, not as an individual. You know, they say on TV all the time, America is the richest country in the world. Well, there's still homeless people here. There's still a lot of poor people here. But as a nation... We're the richest people in the world. When God said Israel was his chosen people, he wasn't saying this Israelite, that Israelite, that Israelite. That. He said the nation of Israel is my people. So then people, they, they were not individually adopted into salvation as, as we are as in faith, but they were adopted as a nation to be God's chosen people. You know, think about this. God could adopt anybody. I don't know if you realize that or not. God could adopt it. The Amalekites, God could have adopted uh, whoever he wanted to adopt. But God chose the nation of Israel. Now, you may sit there tonight and say, well, how dare God? Why didn't he choose uh, whoever? Well, because he's God. God gets to do what he wants, folks. He, 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 he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. We have no place to even begin to try to tell God what he should do. We are just blessed to be a part of the program. If God chooses to adopt the nation of Israel, then he chooses to adopt it. And guess what? We serve him anyways. Because he is, again, the Lord, Lord, and kings of kings. The second thing we see in his glory is that the Israelites was led by the Shekinah glory of God. Guess what? Not every group of people was led by God's glory. You don't see it showing up in Great Britain right now or in Germany or Nigeria or wherever. But at a point in time, the Shekinah glory of God came down and led the people of Israel personally. God chose to do this. He gave covenants to the nation of Israel. They gave the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, the Davidic covenant, all to the nation of Israel. And guess what? With every mistake Israel made, if you've read your Bible, they made plenty. Those covenants were never done away with. Why? Because guess who sealed the covenant? God did. 
God is not changing. God's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And because of that, God shows his favor with Israel. They received the law, which we, the Gentiles, never received. And Israel alone was given the service of God. In the scriptures, it talks about how to do temple service, sacrifices, priesthood, all a way of approaching God. Guess what? The pagans, the Gentiles, never got that opportunity. Why? Because the Israelites were chosen as God's people in that. And Israel made the most important, most profound thing was given the promise concerning the Messiah and his a thousand year reign and the glory of the land that was to come, the Messiah that was to come from the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, the seed of Jacob, through the tribe of Judah, the house of David. Jesus came first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Could have came to anybody, anyone he chose to come to. But part of God's plan, he chose out the nation of Israel. And if you look at his lineage, as we have been studying on, on Sunday morning and a little bit on Sunday night last week, we talked about how his lineage was not perfect. David definitely was not perfect. Rahab most certainly was not perfect. And no one in there was perfect. But God chose to use an imperfect people to bring a perfect Messiah into the world to be the unblemished Lamb of God, to be the sacrifice for our sins. Folks, while Israel as an individual, you know, I, I got friends that are Jewish. They are from that lineage of David. And I'll talk to them and they'll say, well, I don't need to get saved. I'm Jewish. And I say, you're wrong. You're wrong. Well, the Israelites are God's chosen people. Why did Jesus come to them? He came to them to give them the good news of grace, to share the gospel with them. And they are part of God's prophetic plan. And we see that the nation of Israel will be saved and will turn to Christ. But guess what? A lot will die lost before that happens. Folks, the nation of Israel needs the gospel just as well as anyone needs the gospel. Because while we know they will be saved and they'll be part of that millennial reign in, in the thousand year kingdom and be part of God's prophetic plan, so many have died unsaved since then. We need to preach the gospel so they need to hear the gospel. So God has chosen them for this plan, but individually they need to be saved and born again. Just as God has chosen the church in this dispensation of grace that we are in to preach the gospel of grace to a lost and dying world. But guess what? People have got to be saved and become a part of the church. Let's look down to verse 6 and 7 where the word says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham. They are all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And Paul wants to clarify, because a lot of people hear this message and they hear what the scripture says and they say, but, but God blessed the seed of Abraham. Why would uh, only the ones that are saved by grace through faith go to heaven? Well, he makes it very plain and simple here and says, while it is the seed of Abraham, guess what? Ishmael was also the seed of Abraham. And they're not part of God's prophetic plan. You see, when we look at the two uh, uh, children that we see that Abraham had, one through Hagar and one through Sarah, Paul wants to bring out the fact that only Abraham's seed Isaac was chosen by God to be part of that prophetic line. It's not just the seed of Abraham. It's the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, the seed of Joseph. Not the seed of Abraham, the seed of Ishmael. Why? Because God in his sovereignty, the word sovereignty means authority. I don't know if you know this, but God's got all authority. God can choose to do whatever he wants. If God, <coughs> excuse me, by his authority, chooses to send us into the mission field, guess what? He's going to get us there. It may take some work, just like it did Jonah. He'll get us there. If God calls someone to preach, God will get them there. They may go through a lot to get there, but God will get them there. Because God has ultimate control. See, that's the thing. When something happens, it happens because God caused it to happen or God allowed it to happen. God's in total control is the way it has to work. And you probably say, well, what about bad, the bad things? Well, the bad things happen in the Bible, but you know what God did? Look at the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh enslaved the nation of Israel. And God could have divinely forced the Pharaoh to let Israel go. But no, he gave the Pharaoh free will. And as the Pharaoh chose to reject the way of God, God used the Pharaoh 
anyways because he used them as an example of his wrath and his judgment. Folks, we, yeah, we got free will to make decisions, good and bad, but regardless, God is not going to let us hamper his ultimate plan. If God, if we've already read the book of the Revelation, we've studied on Wednesday night, we know how this is all going to wrap up and how it's all going to come to pass. The devil has no place in the playbook to make that not happen. God's sovereign. God's total control. God's total authority. God has all power. And when God says, it shall come to be, it shall come to be. we got people all around the planet right now being paid millions of dollars trying to figure how to save the world. Guess what? It's going up in a ball of fire. I don't care what you do. I don't care how many different programs you put into place, how much money you spend. It's all going to go up in a ball of fire anyway. It's because God said it will be. And guess what? We ain't going to need it. We ain't going to be here. It's useless to us. We're going to be in a better place. But Paul wants the people to understand here that every individual member of the nation of Israel must turn to Christ. And Paul wants to remind again that this will not be for all of Israel. As we see all, or all the city of Abraham, as we see Ishmael mentioned. And Paul also makes a difference here in verse 8 and 9 where it says, That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are accounted for the seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come. And Sarah shall have a son. Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by her father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It, it, it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And that word hated there means not chosen. Now, as we look at what we are seeing here and the verses we just read as, as, as Paul is trying to make the comparison here, he starts off with Sarah. And we see that, you know, people always want to say, well, the reason that Ishmael was not chosen was he was conceived in sin. Now, I'm here to tell you now that I don't believe that. Because we give the next example, Jacob and Esau, who Paul goes on to say hadn't even been born yet when the decision was made by God that which one would he choose? Which one would he favor? And we see in the book of Jeremiah that it says that he was chosen before he was conceived in his mother's womb. Now why did God choose one and not choose the other? Because that was God's decision. And his ways are far greater than our ways. A lot of times when we look at bad things that happen, we say, well, you know, uh, you hear the term, well, that was karma, or well, they done this, or well, they done that. Well, that's all Middle Eastern who hatches. All that is. The bottom line is the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. We live in a sin cursed world that good things happen to bad people, and bad things sometimes happen to good people. That's just the way the world we are living in is. And there are times that, that God chooses one man to preach, or one, one, one man to sing, or someone to teach. Or someone to be a missionary. And a lot of times we want to ask, well, why didn't God choose me for this or choose me for that? Well, because it wasn't part of God's plan. I talk all the time at school. A lot of times, uh, I'm a firm believer, the problem a lot of time at work is people don't know their role. Because we all got roles to play. And people say, what do you think about this? Asking a question that some boss has, has made. And I say, well, it ain't my decision to make. I think I was told to do it, so I'll do it the best of my ability. End of story. Why? Because I'm not on the planning committee. I'm on the serving committee. Well, a lot of times in churches, we want to become little gods. We want to say, well, God should have done this. God should have done that. Or God should have blessed this one. Or God should have blessed that one. There's been more men called to preach by people in a church than there have been God over the years. Well, I'll tell you, I know some guys who went through that. They were good speakers, they were well-loved, they were charismatic. People aggravated them to death to get behind a pulpit, and then they were miserable, burned out, and didn't last. What we have to realize is when God makes a calling, when God makes a choosing, when God makes a decision, God knows what's best. God knows the long game. The only thing we see in ourselves is the past. Every decision you've ever made in your life is based on previous experience may not realize it is true. I can say it in my life. 
If I make a decision about a job, it's because of something I saw in the past. God's decision is based on His unlimited knowledge and unlimited wisdom. So why would we ever think that we should tell God His business? I got news for you. Your salvation, guess what the Bible says? The Bible says, those whom He called, He justified. And those whom He justified, He glorified. You know what that means? That means God is the author and finisher of your faith. That means you didn't even have no, nothing to do with God until he reached down and got a hold of you. That's the same for all. The Bible says that, that a man does not seek God, that God seeks man. You see, you look at the two boys here that he called. I, I, I will tell you up front, God did not call me to preach because I was the best human. God did not call me to preach because I was the best speaker. God not called me to preach because he thought I was to be perfect at it because I make mistakes every single day and, and there's plenty of times I step late at night worried about the next decision i got to make. But guess what? God called me because by his grace. When God called you to salvation, he never said, it's not like we picked teams in school. If you think back when you were in school in gym class, they divided and said, you two are team captains, now you pick your teams to play football. Well, us fat boys like me was always picked last. Because why? We had nothing to contribute to that team. We've been better cheerleaders than football players, probably. However, though we divided up. When God chose people to save, he didn't work that way. He never said, that one's a good singer, I'll take that one. This one's a good preacher, I'll take that one. This one's good this. No, you know what he did? He looked at a whole mess of wretched people with nothing to offer. And he gave his only begotten son to die for them. Offering salvation to a bunch of people who've done nothing to contribute to it besides sin and need it. We were a bunch of beggars, not worthy of anything, and God gave us grace and mercy and forgiveness and a relationship and adoption all by His choosing. You see, that was God's plan. It's God's plan of salvation. Not the Baptist plan, not Justin's plan, not your plan, but God's plan. God can make whatever stipulations he wanted. God can say, and here's the thing, this is how complicated we make it. I've watched it be complicated too many churches over the years. I try to keep it simple here. And even I sometimes look back and say, I didn't say it clear enough. I've met people who say, you've got to be saved right here. Well, this is a fine place to be saved, but it ain't got to happen right here. I see people say, well, you've got to be in the church for it to count. Well, that's silly too. There wasn't even church buildings back then. Notice what the Bible says. All it says is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It says we are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God. It is justification by faith. Just as if I never sinned because I believe that Jesus Christ done everything it takes for me to be worthy of salvation. Just and offer nothing. And that was when I truly got saved. Listen, I prayed a sinner's prayer probably 500 times in my life. But I didn't know what I was saying. That's the thing. You've got to understand it. You don't have to know the whole Bible, but you've got to realize you're a sinner and you've got nothing to do to earn favor with God. And you've got to realize that Jesus Christ has done everything to pay the penalty for your sin. If you don't realize those two things, you're not saved. You've got to understand that. And as when I came to that and threw myself on the mercies of God, I was fully and forever saved. Why? Because God chose to do so. We'll read a couple more verses tonight before we close out. I want to get a couple more verses in where it says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not up to him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. If you want to think back, and I can say the same thing for myself, you probably know people saying, well, then you've met Christians who will say, well, I, God blessed me because I've done X, Y, and Z. Or, God loves my church more because we do this. I mean, I've, I've heard it all. I heard some person say, well, we sent, we have church for four hours, so we're getting blessed extra bunch of our church services are longer. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it is all by grace. Now, if you can't earn salvation, you can't earn favor for God, guess what? Everything you get, you get because God is 
good. It's as simple as that. The Bible says all good things come from above. And it is the good pleasure of God to give us an abundant life. Not because we deserve it, but because we're blessed to get it. I want you to really, you know, I love to see a, major, a big move of God take place in our community. Not just in our church, in our community. It'd be awesome if it happens here, but I just want to see people saved more than anything. But, and a lot of times we think that we need to do all these things for that to happen. But notice here where it's all coming from is God. We're learning that on Sunday morning too. That it was the power of God that brought down the wall of Jericho. It was the power of God that moved in people's behalf. But, but think about this. We're just blessed to be a part of the program. We're blessed to get to witness it. We're blessed to get to hear about it. And when God uses us through singing or testifying or witnessing or feeding people clothing, whatever we're doing, man, that's just an extra blessing for us. God don't need us. God don't need anybody. God is God. God could breathe the world into existence. We're pretty insignificant to him. But we are blessed that he lets us do it. I may have used this certain illustration here before because my brain is very foggy anymore and I repeat myself. I'm at that stage of life. But I thought of it this way. You know, there's plenty of times we let our kids help us do stuff. Now, we let them help us do stuff to, to teach them stuff. But we can do it faster without if we want to be honest. It's a true problem. When we helped our parents, it was the same way. It was not because they necessarily needed us in that moment, but because we wanted to teach them how to change the oil in a car, or how to make cornbread, or, or how to bake a cake. They need to learn that lesson. Well, when God allows us to be a part, it's the same thing. God don't need our help in witnessing and testifying and reaching others. But guess what? God allows us to be a part of that, that project because he is teaching us something. He's teaching us of his power and of his goodness and of his grace. And, and, and still to this day, when I see a person get saved or see a kid get excited about God, it really stirs something up in me. I, I think back to the fact that I'm so unworthy and yet God saved me. I think back to every sin I committed after salvation and still continue to mess up and slip up and stumble and commit. And I think, my goodness, and God still loves me. Because guess what? Because God is good. God is love, the Bible says. And when we see that, it is not because we are good. It is because God is good. And he's patient and long-suffering. He is forgiving. He is, he is loving. He is nurturing. And we, as we looked at Romans 8 this morning, nothing, 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 nothing separates us from his love, which is anchored not in Justin, but anchored in Christ Jesus. I am thankful tonight, above all things, that that love of God is not dependent upon me. Because much like the nation of Israel, the Mosaic covenant, Davidic covenant, Abrahamic covenant, was dependent upon those who made the covenant, they would have been gone forever ago. Israel messed up more times than they done it right. And if I look at my own life, I am thankful that my relationship with God was not based upon me. Because if it was, it had been gone a long time ago. Because I've messed up plenty of times in my life. But my love, my God's love for me, His relationship with me is anchored in Jesus Christ. And that's a part of God's amazing grace that we get to enjoy as we walk forward in our Christian walk. So I'm going to ask Sadie to come on up. We're going to close out tonight on page 164. As we spoke of God's amazing grace, we're going to sing of God's amazing grace.